Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambeau channel. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse has stated publicly that he is tired of, quote, asinine comments from uninformed pundits, end quote. And so what is he referencing here? Well, it's, uh, it's articles the likes of this. Here's the headline from Vice. Crypto exchanges refuse to freeze all Russian accounts. So I'm going to share with you his comments, then I'm going to do a full breakdown of the situation and why so many of those in the media, uh, their takes that uh, all of this should be shut down, how they could not be more incorrect possibly. They could not be. I've been really looking forward to making this video. I've been speaking on this topic on and off for like most of the last week because there's been so many stupid comments about this. But I'll tell you what, this hot jam right here on the Moon Lambeau channel uh, this is going to be the most comprehensive takedown of that perspective. There's lots to learn here, I kid you not. In fact, I've got a thread, I, I teased it a little bit in the last video that I put out. Uh, there's a, a well-known attorney within the world of crypto who really fleshed out a very articulate position with tons of facts and data, and I really think you're going to enjoy it. But uh, before going any further, I do want to be clear, I do not have a legal or financial background of any kind. I'm not offering legal or financial advice, and you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say or write. I'm just an enthusiast who enjoys making YouTube videos about crypto topics, but just as a hobby and just for fun. And so this article that, that I just shared with you, the headline here, there's an individual named Rob Price that shared that article uh, on Twitter. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse retweeted that share, and Brad wrote the following. I continue to see asinine arguments from uninformed pundits of how crypto works. I want to reiterate what Ashish Birla said yesterday. Let me pause there. Ashish Birla is Ripple's, uh, 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 he's the uh, general manager of, of, uh, of RippleNet. Uh, he's actually one of Ripple's original employees, and he put out this thread. I already did an entire video breakdown of this, so I'm not going to read this again. It's what's it's the thread that's on your screen right now. Uh, one of the things that he highlighted is that there is not nearly enough liquidity for Russia uh, in existence in crypto for Russia to uh, to take advantage of, of crypto, like because you know the, the whole idea being. Russia's cut out of the, you know, the, the SWIFT system, and they're not entirely cut out, by the way, but uh, can Russia just replace that with crypto? That's what a bunch of people like Senator Elizabeth Warren are saying, because she doesn't know what the ever-loving hell she's talking about, and many others are saying that, too. Well, she's Berla pointed out a bunch of stuff, including uh, crypto markets are not nearly liquid enough to even make that happen. It's not even a possibility, even just for that reason alone. And so that's what Brad Garlinghouse is referencing there. And so again, he said, I want to reiterate what Ashish Birla said yesterday. There are factual reasons why crypto can't be used on the broad scale for Russia to evade sanctions. In order to convert crypto to fiat, exchanges, etc., rely on banking partners who could lose their licenses if someone on the OFAC list is able to slip through. Extremely stringent KYC slash AML policies are in place to avoid precisely this. RippleNet, for example, has always been and remains today committed to not working with sanctioned banks or countries that are restricted counterparties. Ripple and our customers support and enforce OFAC laws and KYC slash AML. Instead of listening to responsible players who have been clear they will abide by legal sanctions, some pundits and media insist on continuing to paint crypto as the Silk Road, both an exceptionally outdated and tired argument which simply doesn't hold true today. Rant over. Golf clap for Mr. Garlinghouse, everybody. He's that's solid, and he's absolutely correct. So what's what's being said here? Well, I don't want to read this article. I, I really want to get to the, the most important points, but I want you to know what was covered in this article. The, basically, the perspective on this thing, and this, this is the article I cited, which is from Vice titled, Crypto Exchanges Refuse to Freeze All Russian Accounts. There are uh, the, the CEOs cited in here of various cryptocurrency exchanges which are refusing to, uh, to shut down the accounts of, of Russians. And uh, like, all, like all, all Russian citizens, mind you. And, and and so the the way that that's being painted as, oh my gosh, but the money can flow from Russia to who knows where. This that, that That's the picture that's being painted here. Now, as we get into the specifics, you'll see that this is silly for a number of reasons. The truth of the matter is the argument that the, the exchange CEOs are making are that it's not their place to decide 
who should be granted and denied um, access to to to, um, to 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 markets, basically, and any, anything having to do with finance, specifically, or in this case, obviously, crypto, because uh, the individuals, like individual citizens in Russia, they are not all sanctioned. Who you'll see as I go through the specifics, but you know, it's it's Putin himself and other specifics. It's not your everyday uh, individual in Russia. There are also, by the way, there are all sorts of. Uh, citizens of Russia that are very against what's happening regarding the invasion of Ukraine. Just consider that as as well. But uh, it's it's it, think think about this. And so if you think that the, the the people running these exchanges are wrong and they should shut down access even from the citizens, you understand what the implications of that would be, right? And that what what kind of precedent that you're setting there. The next time that uh, you're on a side of some sort of political matter and the exchanges think one way and you think the other way, should they be able to just remove you from the system? Does that sound right to you? You know, because that's, that's the door that you're opening here. So rather what the, what the uh, exchanges are saying is it's not their place. This is what they're saying. The exchanges are saying it's not our place to uh, engage in politics here and, and, and determine who should or should not have access to markets just in general. And so they're abiding by the law. If governments are their governments in which they operate are saying these people are entities, whatever they're sanctioned, they're abiding by the laws. They're not breaking any laws. And that's true not just of exchanges, but of other entities in finance working outside of crypto. And so th this is an important concept that is clearly missed by much of mainstream media. They simply don't get it. And I don't know about you. I do not want exchanges getting into to politics and banning people uh, just because they're on the wrong side of this. Or that. I don't want that to be the case. It's not their place to do it. They don't get they shouldn't be deciding. And that's the, the point they're making. They, they shouldn't be deciding those types of things. And so now let's let's go to the breakdown that I was talking about here. This is from Jake Shervinsky who is a, a, a lawyer who is well known in the world of crypto. And he shared the following with his 101,200 followers, followers on, on Twitter. And I'm going to run through this whole thing. It is pure gold and you will learn a lot from this. And I find it very persuasive. I don't know how anybody on the opposing side, like even if you're one of the, the people that happens to think that I'm wrong to this point based on what I've said, that's fine. We can always respectfully disagree. But Hear this whole thing. I don't know how you can hear all the facts I'm about to share with you and then think, yes, these people at these exchanges should be unilaterally making decisions to take away um, financial freedom from individuals. I, I just, just let me go through this. Hear, hear all the facts and then you tell me if I'm right or I'm wrong. But here's what Jake Shervinsky wrote. Russia can't and won't use crypto to evade sanctions. Concerns about crypto's use for sanctions evasion are totally unfounded. They fundamentally, fun, they fundamentally misunderstand how sanctions work, how crypto markets work, and how Putin is actually trying to mitigate sanctions. I'll explain. To begin, I want to express my strong and unequivocal support for the people of Ukraine fighting a totalitarian invader to defend their homes and their basic rights to liberty and self-sovereignty. Glory to Ukraine. The free world must assist Ukraine and fight back against Putin. One way for the free world to fight back is by imposing severe economic sanctions on Russia. Sanctions are a foreign policy tool used to influence the behavior and diminish the capability of foreign actors. They seek to deter and punish bad acts through economic consequences. Here's how U.S. sanctions work. First, sanctions must be authorized by the president in an executive order or by Congress in legislation. Second, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, or OFAC for short, designates specific targets for sanctions. Individuals, companies, governments, etc. OFAC adds targets to the specially designated nationals and blocked persons. So that's SDN, and that's going to be repeated throughout this, so just remember that. Uh, SDN stands for Specially Designated Nationals. So again, this office, the OFAC office, adds targets to this list, the, the SDN list, Specially Designated Nationals and Blocked Persons list, uh, which is available at a link that he shared right there, which I didn't pull up. It's, it, it, it's not necessary for the purposes of this video. And then he writes the following. This is important, folks. It is illegal for any U.S. person to transact with any person on the SDN list. This is the crux of sanctions, cutting SDNs off from the U.S. economy. 
This is crucial to understanding sanctions policy. The main goal of U.S. sanctions is to deprive SDNs of access to the U.S. economy by making it illegal for U.S. persons to transact with them. SDNs can't buy U.S. goods or services, sell products to U.S. markets, or uh, own U.S. property, etc. So pause right there. So again, the SDNs, these are the, the individuals and entities that have been blocked by the U.S. OFAC. They've been blocked. And that's why I've been stating it doesn't matter if you're talking about crypto or the legacy financial system. You're in serious trouble if you, if, if you don't abide by the sanctions. You're going to jail, folks. There's no leniency here. You're, you're going to be in serious, serious trouble here. And so for uh, someone like Senator Elizabeth Warren to come out publicly, as she has, stating that crypto can be used uh, for, uh, to Russia's benefit, holy hell is she missing the mark. For so many reasons, and, and this is only the beginning, I, there's a lot more to flesh out. Check this out. Jake Shervinsky continues. To be most effective, U.S. sanctions laws are extremely broad. U.S. person means every U.S. individual, company, etc., all over the world. The law prohibits direct and indirect transactions, plus facilitation. Violations are strict liability offenses, zero tolerance for errors. Now, this brings us to Russia. The United States and her allies have imposed severe sanctions on Russia as punishment for invading Ukraine and to deter further aggression. These sanctions aren't comprehensive. They're targeted at Putin, his oligarchs, the government, and other state entities. And by the way, if I could just pause to note, uh, if, if you want to expand any of these sanctions anywhere, you know where I'd, I'd go before, uh, you know, just increasing it to everyone else in the damn country? is uh, maybe, <laughs> there's a lot of reasons this won't happen, and I'm not even necessarily saying that I'm good, I'm just saying if you wanted to get harsher, what you would do, not, again, I'm not even saying that for sure that I want to do this, but um, because <laughs> you're talking about serious war at that point. There's a lot of stuff to think through before coming to this conclusion, but what you do is you'd, um, you'd, you'd ban um, via SWIFT uh, any, um, any international money flows having to do with Russia's greatest exports, which would be uh, the oil and natural gas. Because that's basically Russia's economy. And so if you take that out, if you take that out, uh, serious problems. But uh, that would also be serious problems for uh, neighboring countries because that oil flows to all sorts of people uh, over in, in Europe. And so you'd be talking about taking out the huge, like, what that would do to the economies of those countries. I mean, it, 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 there would be serious impact. So again, there isn't an appetite currently to make that happen. And again, I'm not supposed to say that that should, should occur. There's so much to consider. There's probably things I haven't considered, which is why I don't have a firm stance on that. I'm just saying, if you wanted to, that would be the thing to do if you really want to get serious about Russia. But, um, anyway, Jake Shervinsky then continues. Uh, in addition to these sanctions, we've also frozen assets of Russian oligarchs and central bank, limited Russian banks' access to SWIFT, banned Russian flights in EU airspace. Uh, this list isn't complete, and more sanctions are being discussed every day, but you get the idea. These sanctions have been devastating for Russia so far, and will likely be even more effective over time. But some people are suggesting that crypto could give Russia a way to evade or mitigate these sanctions. Is that plausible? Not at all. I'll give you three reasons why. First, Russia's access to a global payment network <coughs> excuse me, has nothing to do with the goal of primary sanctions. Cutting Russia off from the United States economy. It's illegal for U.S. persons to transact with SDNs, period. It doesn't matter if they use dollars, gold, seashells, or Bitcoin. U.S. persons around the world are cutting ties with Russian SDNs right now, regardless of what payment system they were using previously. There's zero reason to think crypto's existence will convince any of them to willfully violate sanctions laws risking fines and jail time. What about SWIFT, you ask? SWIFT is a messaging service that facilitates interbank transactions. Kicking 
Russian banks off SWIFT will make it harder for them to conduct business, but it's not the same as banning Russia from the global financial system, as some have said. Let me pause. I've said that too. I've been saying that in the, for days now. If if Russia wants to have relationships with with other entities in a country, whether it's another central bank or, or just regular banks or any sort of financial institutions, and on the other side they want to have that relationship with Russia, they can still have that. They can still choose to develop that relationship. They just need to have a different messaging system. I pointed this out multiple times. Jake Shervinsky continues. Rather, as with primary sanctions, the goal is to deprive Russia of services offered by the free world. SWIFT is a service. Russia doesn't get to use it anymore. That's the sanction. Some Russian banks can still do cross-border transfers. They just can't use SWIFT for that. Crypto works the same way. U.S. crypto companies offer a variety of services. Russia doesn't get to use them anymore. That's the sanction, just as with all U.S. goods and services. Russia's ability to use the underlying technology doesn't let them evade the sanctions in any way. So pause here. Again, this is, is kind of what I was getting at. Do you want this? Do you want in any in the future, do you want the cryptocurrency exchanges to, to make these types of decisions on all sorts of political issues just, just as, a, as a matter of policy? Or do you just want them to follow the law? I just want them to follow the law. Doesn't that seem to make rational sense? If I'm missing something, you all let me know in the comment section below. That, that's what I think. Anyway, uh, Jake Shervinsky continues now. Um, yeah, what did I last read right there? I think it was this part, right? Uh, I'm sorry if I'm rereading a part, but here, here uh, it was roughly here. U.S. crypto companies offer a variety of services. Russia doesn't get to use them anymore. That's the sanction, just as with all U.S. goods and services. Uh, Russia's ability to use the underlying technology doesn't let them evade the sanction in any way. Can crypto mitigate sanctions by offering an alternative to SWIFT? Not really. If Russia wants an alternative, they're far more likely to use China's CIPS than a public network they can't control. Regardless, there's nobody in the free world to do business with them anyway. Second point of three. Crypto markets are too small, costly, and transparent to be useful for the Russian economy. Crypto markets are thin to start with, and ruble trading pairs are rare. With Russia cut off from the, uh, the world's crypto industry, they can't source nearly enough liquidity to matter. So pause. That's the, the topic that Ashish Birla was talking about. Said that uh, Russia's daily needs of memory serve something like $50 billion a day typically. Well, Bitcoin is... <laughs> It's roughly 20 to $50 billion a day. So just Russia, one country, Russia, would eat up all of Bitcoin's liquidity in a single day. There's not enough there, folks. There simply is not enough liquidity there. The, the crypto markets are way too small. They're, they're too fledgling. They've been around over a decade, I know. Crypto's in its nascency. I keep, that's why I keep saying that. Like, if you feel like you're late to the party, no, you're at the beginning end of things. You're at the very beginning end of things. Crypto's minuscule right now. Uh, anyway, Jake Shervinsky continues. Russia also can't hide its tracks with crypto. Setting aside valid privacy concerns, the transparency of public ledgers, plus the analytics capabilities of U.S. forensics firms equals crypto is useless for sanctions evasion. And the Treasury Department put it best. And take a look, here's a quote from a, a piece that was shared here. Um, the scale of what they have to move and where they have to move things from, crypto is not necessarily going to be that concerning, said Todd Conklin, Counselor to the Deputy Treasury Secretary. Any attempt to move that much money through exchanges would contribute to a bit more of a spike in the crypto market, in my view, that has been observed lately. So there you go. If there's a huge money flow, you can connect the dots, folks. And ledgers are public. Crypto is not a good way to hide transactions, right? This would not be a good op option also for, uh, for Russia. Uh, Jake Shervinsky continues. Third. The reality is Putin spent years trying to sanctions-proof Russia and crypto isn't part of his plan. His strategy included diversifying Russia's reserves into yuan and gold, not crypto, shifting trade to Asia, not onto blockchains, bringing manufacturing onshore, etc. Putin could have built crypto infrastructure if he wanted. He didn't. There's no reason to think he will or could now. And then he writes, here's a New York Times article which stoked fears about crypto and sanctions evasion last week on Putin's real strategy. 
zero mentions of crypto. And I'm not going to pull it up for the sake of this video. It's, it's not necessary for the points that we made. And then he wraps up his thread by stating, there are other reasons why crypto doesn't create sanctions evasion risk and uh, more to say about how crypto is being used to support Ukraine and the many innocents caught in the crossfire. But this thread is getting long, so I'll wrap it here. More to come. Golf clap for Mr. Shavitsky, everybody. Absolutely hitting the nail on the head in the most comprehensive way that I've seen to date. Absolutely knocking this thing right out of the park. And if you've been watching my videos where I've been talking about this over most of the last week, I've been saying much of the same things. And he, he posted this early evening just, just yesterday. And so I started reading it last night and I didn't have a chance to actually finish it until this morning. And then once I finished it, I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. I'm making a video about this. Uh, knocking this out of the freaking park. Crypto is not the bad guy. It is not going to be used by Russia for nefarious intent because it, 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 there's so many reasons. It t like From a technical perspective, it just can't happen. And uh, then on top of that, to make crypto exchanges out to be the bad guys when they're following the rule of law, I think that really is disgusting and misses the mark. It's, it's, I'm not down with that. So uh, you let me know in the comment section below. If I'm wrong, then please articulate why you think that uh, crypto people running cryptocurrency exchanges should delve into politics and make uh, decisions on their own about who should have access to financial networks. You, you go ahead, that's, you've got quite the uphill battle if, you, if that's your perspective. I, I will respectfully disagree if you really think that, that's fine. But I would love to hear from you if you actually think that makes sense. But I will wrap up here. I am not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say are right. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon Lambo.